Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmeltzley. Hey, Glenn here. Welcome to Funnel Reboot, where we explore how to upgrade our lead generation. Today, we're marking episode number 42. And I thought I was going to talk about the answer to life, the universe, and everything, but instead we're going to be talking about marketing automation. But before we get into that, let me remind you of some great episodes we've recently been having. There's one on Google Analytics 4, changes to search engine results pages, several episodes on the strategy and execution around how to create content. If you want to catch those, please go ahead and subscribe. But know that episode ideas come from your feedback. I'd love to know what you're hungry for so I can fetch you the answers. You can do that by tweeting me at Funnel Reboot, or you can comment back to me. I'm on Instagram as well. Or you can go to our FunnelReboot.com site. You can leave me a message there, or you can call our listener feedback line at 613-703-7073. Now, turning to today and marketing automation, we take it as a natural part of how companies of all sizes market today. But, you know, it's almost by luck that we actually have this technology. Until a little while ago, contacting prospects and customers, it was pretty difficult. And it came with enterprise-sized price tags. We only have to go back about 20, 25 years. And the CRM landscape was dominated by PeopleSoft and Oracle and Siebel. Massive packages. And to send out mass emails... Oh, there were a couple of products. There was YesMail, there was Unity Mail, Exact Target, Flow Network. Well, these companies kind of lost their oligopoly because in the year 2000, the cloud-based CRM Salesforce came along and a bunch of entry-level email tools like MailChimp and others. And these were followed by a newer breed of tools that sent emails that also bolted onto a website. And they let you trace when email recipients revisited your site. This is where I would say the marketing automation platforms began. They had the power of the old enterprise systems, but they were at a much lower price point. And they talked to CRMs. Our guest was also one of the people who got excited about this. And around 2010, he was so intrigued that he decided to act as a consultant and show companies how to take advantage of the tools. Today, he specializes in revenue generation engines for these SMBs, and he works to help them succeed with marketing automation independently or sometimes part of their team. He also works through a nonprofit organization called Invest Ottawa as an advisor to companies who are trying to scale using this. I want you to listen in the episode where he talks about how to set up a marketing automation campaign doing it so that it will keep in touch with buyers throughout their journey. I personally love in this talk how he avoids jargon when describing rather technical parts of this. And he's also got a ton of actionable tips for both prospect and customer communication. Let's go hear from our guest. Today, I'm really fortunate to have Steve Schock on the podcast. Welcome, Steve. Hi, Glenn. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. So you have uh, the envious job of working with a lot of companies and you've seen really tricked out uh, sets of marketing stacks out there. Can you give me like a general description of what a really good full marketing stack uh, at a cl client looks like? What, uh, what kind of things do you see when you walk into places that have it all done? Uh, so I think it's fair to start with, um, you know, not to make this so daunting, but we'll start with a kind of the, to the type of company or company size. So let's assume I'm walking into a, you know, a post revenue startup. So somebody who's got some, you know, a, a little bit of MRR, maybe they've got a 10 or $15,000 a month MRR. They've got one, uh -huh. maybe two people on the, on the marketing team and a sales team and then, you know, operations and stuff. So, so you know, I, I, I would say a good marketing stack is is one that starts uh, centers around a CRM, uh, whether it be uh, Salesforce or HubSpot or Active Campaign. Uh, yep. Generally, not Salesforce because that, that sometimes comes later because it is expensive. But let's say it's Active Campaign or HubSpot. So, 
you've got you've got it where your sales are engaging with contacts on a regular basis and they're logging all the activity in the CRM. So uh, that's sales. So then if we back up a little bit, uh, to, integrated with the uh, CRM would be a marketing yep. automation platform. Okay. So the marketing automation platform, in my view, is the platform that allows you to uh, engage new prospects uh, and current prospects, measure the activity uh, that you're doing with those prospects, and warm them up uh, to turn them into somebody that sales is ready to talk to. Uh, or sorry, 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 sales should talk to, right? Right. So um, a marketing automation platform uh, usually has uh, f- um, the forms on your website uh, are linked up to the marketing automation platform so that as people register for things and download things on your website, that uh, contact information is sent to the marketing automation platform. Um, and, and of course, once it's in the marketing automation platform that you can track the activity that each one of those users is doing. So, and the goal of a marketing automation platform is as you're gathering all this data of what people are doing, you're learning, uh, the tactics that are working and the tactics that aren't right. So, um, uh, so, and, and, and the purpose, uh, is to, um, have these leads uh, uh, engage in as many tac- sorry engage in as many thoughtful tactics as possible uh, yes. in order to get them ready for sales. So there's one statistic I really love from uh, Gartner or Forrester that says the average B two B contact uh, engages with the brand up to seven times before they uh, reach out for uh, reach out to sales or or yeah. put, end up for a demo. So you know. Each of those seven interactions um, is is managed through the the marketing automation platform, uh, or is tracked through the marketing automation platform. Sure. Um, or, sorry, go. You, uh, so okay, so uh, tricked out stacks. So you've got a marketing automation platform that is attracting and measuring users. You've got the CRM, which is uh, um, managing uh, the interact, helping sales managing interaction with the prospects. You've also got a very good uh, content management system uh, and blog system that's allowing you to very quickly uh, post. Uh, post content, um, so you can engage in marketing uh, in, in some kind of uh, content marketing efforts. Right. Okay. So there's a few things there that, if I think of the average uh, small business and what they're doing, um, it sounds like there's a shift that has to happen because um, while it's true that those small businesses are pumping out content. Um, the steps you described being done by the marketing automation and CRM platforms, these seem to be uh, a lot more automated and probably working at a much higher scale than we can do if we are sending out stuff, let's say via, you know, a regular newsletter or, right. you know, we're doing little, you know, artisanal type of emails where right. we're sending them out individually. And that seems to me to be one of the, key distinctions between where marketing is just pumping out stuff as fast as it can versus the, the scenario you describe where they're really helping sales. Like sales is noticing that those seven touches have happened and sales really just has to do qualification Mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, preparing the opportunity to close. Right. Yep. That's exactly it. So how do we get there? Like if we, if people have heard this and they see gaps between where they are uh, now and where they were, um, can you suggest, you know, what logical order people might do as they take this on? They can't attempt to do it all at once. They're certainly not going to get the budget for it, especially if they don't have an MRR at the levels you're suggesting. So, you know, how do they, how do they make sure that at least what they're doing each day is progressing them towards this big picture that you've point painted for us. Right. So I think that, you know, it's, it's really funny. I just finished uh, with another company um, doing this exact situation. They just started last yep. year and they just <laughs> got a marketing automation system. So what I, nice. what I like to focus on is an automation and everybody's heard of a drip email campaign. So I yep. like to set up a uh, plan for three different automations. The first automation is an automation to attract prospects. 
So uh, it's it's a, between a four and eight email sequence or automation yep. that's sent. You know, and, uh, so that c- concentrates on getting prospects. Or, uh, and and usually, let's say it's a SaaS platform. It's, let's say it's driving to a free demo. So that you sure. have an automation there. The second automation I like to set up is the free trial conversion. So once they've requested that demo or they're in that free trial, we do that 14 day automation to get, to move them to a customer. And then the third automation you do is when they're a customer. Uh, so just there's a four or five step automation um, that you build to make sure that they know where to get help, some of the resources they can get to, maybe some of the upselling that they can use. So, so it's you, you break down the barriers by just thinking about those three different automations. And to be funny, I actually like to do the middle one first. The middle okay. one where where you're you're converting um, free trials to paid, because if you if you drive a bunch of people to your to your free trial and you're not working with uh, and you're not working with them while they're in free trial, the, the conversion rate to to paid is is it's 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 going to be low, right? Yes. So let's worry about converting free to paid first, and then let's worry about attracting people to the uh, freemium, and then we'll worry about the customers. Okay. So you've got. Sure. So no, we, that that makes absolute sense. Um, yeah. And uh, you know, I say this because. I, in my day job, interact with a lot of companies that are a step before that at the, you know, lead generation and prospect generation stage. And uh, what I like about this is you're getting a reliable, let's say, you know, demo to close ratio. Yeah. Or if you don't have a SaaS product, maybe it's a qualification like an MQL Mm -hmm. to a close. So at least if you have assurance that that number is going to be reliable, you can then say, well, I can afford to then go and get this many fresh, you know, signups. Right. And I have a good idea of how many of those signups will be qualified or I'm going to figure that out. But right. I know from qualified down to close, right. that number is solid. And I've got right. some right. forecasts, right? I've got I've got a model that I can use and if the model is hitting a certain threshold, I win. Mm-hmm. And if it's not at that threshold, I still have work to do, but I know what done looks like. Yep. And and, and the, the really happy benefit out of that strategy, Glenn, is the fact that you're exposing some of the some of the weaknesses you might have in your free trial process. Yes. Right? Um, we all talk about these moments of delight you have to have. So you have to have these moment these aha moments for the users in the first, you know, minute hour, day, and five days of the trial, because with every day that goes by, uh, you, you, your drop-off uh, increases. So yeah. forcing yourself to go through that free trial uh, automation exercise to, to send messages and hopefully react to what the user's doing in the trial, uh, it, it, it really makes you think, is this the best way to go? And then once you, you just said it, once you have that free trial process uh, converting to where you want it to be, then it's time to start sending the users with the with the prospecting campaigns uh, right. to to the free trial, right? And see how well they react. Are they, you know, are you getting more people like the people you've already closed? Exactly, exactly. So, so if you're if you're helping sales by doing this, um, and you're trying to move, you know, along, you kind of painted the picture of it, maybe even being done in several quarters, and mm-hmm. thankfully not years. Right. Um, what do you have to start looking for with what you have? I mean, let, let me paint the picture of the kind of early stage company that I see. And one of the things that they start off with, and they don't even realize that it's, um, it's backwards from where they have to end up, they'll, they'll take something like um, a form that they put up on their site mm-hmm. and they uh, receive somebody, you know, filling in, let's say to, you know, download something or maybe get a free look at something. Um, but they work at it from the aspect of, oh, so you must be uh, at this stage in our funnel. And, you know, so this is where we're going to pelt you with all the things that our product does. And, the follow-up email that we're going to send to you in this kind of drip campaign that we do is why haven't you bought it already? Right. (laughs) Um, And you know, that to me, it seems like it's treating everybody the same. And some of them like you in your Forrester example, you know, maybe this is touch number one, maybe it's touch number six. So how, how do we start to think more about what is, 
important to the prospect? And how do we build automation that is respectful of that and doesn't just treat them like they're walking into you know, our, our zone, our funnel, and that we're automatically uh, squeezing them into a mold that they might not fit in. Right, right. Well, I think it, um, I mean, at the end of the day, you're, you, what you're, you're guiding to is that you, you have to know your prospects when you're communicating to them. So, yes. so, um, uh, um, so instead of, uh, of, of talking to everybody the same way that comes to your website or that tries to download a free ebook or whatever it is, it's, it's working to find what segments um, is your product best suited for? What segments do you know are your most intimate, around, uh, whose needs you're most intimate with? And possibly procure lists of these type of, types of people or scrape the internet to get these types of email so you can build a, 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 ser- a drip campaign or an automated campaign that speaks to the needs of every one of those – sorry, the needs of that target audience versus just okay. – spray and pray. I would much rather work with a client that would, that will send 300 emails, um, to a very specific target, um, versus 10,000 emails, uh, to, to a much wider audience. Right. Yes. So, yeah, totally. Yeah. And in these segments, I mean, do you always expect them to be something that you can explicitly get like, you know, a number of employees or revenue, something like that? Or do you sometimes, uh, treat segments as something softer, something more like, well, if we wrote an ebook about this pain point, then, and that person responded strongly to that, then they're in our segment of people who care about this, mm-hmm. right? And we're kind of almost, we're, we're, we're blending in a little bit of things that are implied about them by what they've done, how they've behaved, yeah. not necessarily you know, well, we know this about you, right? right, right. Do, you, do you do you find that we have to kind of step out of our comfort zone and get into some of those fuzzier areas for us to use segmenting properly? I think, Glenn, that's an area that you need to graduate to. Um, okay. I, 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 uh, I don't think uh, new companies that, that we're talking about here that are just embarking on it, um, I don't think, first of all, they won't have the body of data to be able to make those decisions on kind of – True. Imp- implied segmentation but what we like to do is to say you know this is the this is where we want to get to right so the first year of communications will be explicit targeting by job title by geography by company size whatever it is um, so that you can get a body of knowledge and and learn how people are reacting uh, and to what they're reacting and then you can do more uh, implicit profiling and see that's one of the great things about marketing automation is that you can set up uh, this is what marketing automation is uh, it leverages. You can you can go to a specific asset or a specific page, and you can see the types of people that are that, that those pages are resonating with. So you can see, uh, you know, you can you know just to ask the marketing automation sy- system who spent more than two minutes on this page uh, in this section, or who uh, who visited this this uh, group of pages more than once, and you can you can determine. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, what different segments of users, uh, what, what's resonating with them. And you're also speaking a marketer's language because that allows you to do a little bit of testing. So if you're not sure and you have maybe uh, two subject lines and you want to mm-hmm. see which one does a good job or two different types of eBooks, right. then, you know, grab each group. And we know it's not going to be highly scientific, but, having you know a small group that you send something to and then a small group for something else looking at that's how you build that body of data right right exactly you touched on a very very good point there i mean everybody that's a marketer or gonna you know it always talks about a b testing but i i would hazard a guess that it's one of the things that's very rarely done uh yeah. by by people and and i think if i'm when i speak to my uh, early startups, just ingraining that there's a few things you want to ingrain in an early startup. Number one, dedicate, like use a CRM, get away from Excel, make sure your sales is using a CRM to record names uh, uh, and interactions. Number two, AB test as much as you possibly can, at least at minimum, minimum, minimum subject lines and uh, subject lines, period. 
Uh, and then if you can, if you've got time and as time permits, uh, open up your, your, uh, AB testing, but, but <laughs> that's something yeah. we all have to be very good at doing. Right. So let's dive for a second into, um, cause I can just hear some listeners scratching their heads as they are hearing us say that a CRM captures an email address and a marketing automation system captures an email address. Mm-hmm but they actually can do it in different ways. Right. Um, and in the marketing automation case, what's at least encouraged by platforms like HubSpot and I think you said active campaign mm-hmm. is that it's the website visitor who fills in that email address, that it's not necessarily uh, populated by uh, an internal uh, right. email address. Right. Because CRMs can do outbound email, but really, if you're using marketing automation, the best way to use it is to collect those emails inbound. Can you just take us through what that distinction is and and what a marketing automation system uh, is doing that's different? Right. So I think the easiest way to describe it is um, the marketing automation system is used by marketers, obviously, and the CRM is used by sales. Right. Yeah. So um, there's, you know, it's either a shared database, so there's there's one single source of truth, so there's not two duplicates. It's just both systems go off of the same database of names. So as you say, uh, somebody registers for an, uh, sorry registers to download something, uh, or or hits you know re- re- requests to subscribe to your blog, or even uh, you know the marketers upload a list of names from a, from an event when they happen again. So right. They they go to that central database that 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 is seen by the marketing automation system and that can be seen by the CRM, but generally once that name is new, that's when marketing automation happens. That's when um, you identify who of your new names is going to start getting uh, an email series or who of those new names you're going to do a DM piece to, uh, yep. and, and and you're measuring who of those new names have been to what pages. So then after the interaction. Well, okay. So yeah. right on that, I'll stop you just because we want to make clear that uh, marketing automation, what it's doing there, if I read you right, is it knows the IP address of the person who has connected and it has taken kind of the analytics, the behavior of what they've been doing, what pages they've been on, and it's marrying it with an email address they gave you, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. And like that is... You know, for people who've only ever seen CRM, this is like a new and exciting world. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, we don't really have to worry too much because this is legal. Um, so, yep. uh, so HubSpot, so the marketing automation, everybody's probably heard of a cookie. So they just, they, they quote unquote, drop a cookie on everybody's machine and then they can, they can correlate uh, that, correlate, like you just said, Glenn, that person with the activity. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. So now let's say that they sign up and you want to start sending them things just as a practical matter. What's your take on whether that email should be written as if it's from some uh, corporate entity or should it be from a person? So if it's the marketing automation system, mm-hmm. they've, they've logged in, they don't know anybody at that company yet. Right. How do you suggest we, you know, start to build a relationship with them in the from line of that email? Well, I think, Glenn, you hit the nail on the head right there. You want to build a relationship with them. And and, in my opinion, you build a relationship with people. So uh, I I like to have it come from a person, uh, especially for uh, startups, come from either the CEO or somebody in marketing. And that's the consistent, the same person that things should come from through the whole marketing cycle until that person gets passed to sales. And then when they get passed to sales, it comes directly from a salesperson. Right. So, okay. Yeah. All right. And that would be defensible, I guess, when it does come time for them to step into sales. Let's say, you know, there's a guy named Steven Sales, and right. he knows that you've been receiving emails from another contact. He could maybe name them and say, you know, hey, I'm really glad that you've signed up for a demo. I'm Steve. I'm picking up from. Yeah. Right. And it just flows. It just right. like it would in a like a real physical environment. Right, right, exactly. Now, but it, it, and it's interesting though that um, it's funny that I don't want to muddy the waters pretty much, but where you might get to is, is when you're, part, when you're um, 
in the buying cycle, even myself of a large SaaS company, let's say, I, I don't even know if they do this, but let's just say Slack, you know, let, let's say I was buying Slack. They can get away with saying the the onboarding team or the, the pre-sale team because you know right. <laughs> they're a giant company and you're probably not going to be talking to Glenn in sales, right? Good point. But smaller and smaller is intimate is, you know, I, I uh, and, and then you maybe get to a place where it's more, you know, uh, le- less one-on-one. Sure. The common element is I, as the person reading that, am left with, I'm in good hands, right? right. That's yeah. the, that's the, like, you're telling me just sit back, relax. We, we, we've mapped this all out. We know where you're going. We've got you. Right. And so yeah. that handoff, it's a smooth handoff. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't have to be a actual name, but it's got to be a good handoff. You can't have, you know, five different pe- people emailing all at the same time mm-hmm. and having that person, you know, wonder, all right, which one of these people am I supposed to talk to? Oh, exactly. Yep. Uh, let's let's kind of talk about that a little bit. That might be a good place to mention one thing that a lot of people, when they open the hood of a marketing automation tool, really find it daunting, and that's workflows. Mm-hmm. But maybe you can, in really plain language, just take us through, and maybe there's an example we've already covered here where it's actually being done by a workflow mm-hmm. uh, so that people can really get their arms around it. Yeah. So uh, there's a couple different names for it. It could be a workflow. It could be an automation. It could be a drip sequence. So these yeah. are the, the, t- the types of names people call them. And uh, really, at the end of the day, um, Marketing automation is sorry. This the sequence is you you define how a person should enter the sequence, um, uh, what happens during the sequence, and how it comes to a close. Okay, so uh, typical the typical way to enter a sequence is the marketer adding somebody to it manually, uh, uh, or uh, it's triggered by somebody completing a form on a website. So let's just take a very simple marketing automation sequence. So let's say the entry port point is somebody completing the contact us form on your website. So HubSpot or these other marketing automation systems, they just sit there waiting for that to happen. They wait, wait, wait. And as soon as somebody signs up, sorry, completes the contact us form, you can program the automation to say, send them a thank you email uh, and we'll be in touch. Uh, and then if you, so, so, so there's two steps then. It's waiting and then it's sending an email. And then you can, for instance, let's say you wanted to follow up with them in a couple of days to, to just to maybe rate the quality of your service or something like that. You could yep. add a delay to that automation. So you're telling HubSpot or, or the other mark, wait three days before you send the next email. And then so the, the, the marketing automation waits three days and then you tell the automation which email to send. And it sends that email for you. So when you... You keep making those automations more and more complicated as, as you need to. But the essence is tell it when to act, uh, give it something to do uh, until it's got nothing else to do. It's right, really right. Cool. And yeah, that is, I mean, you can get more complicated. I guess the only other part that uh, people will want to know is you can branch these things so it can start to use logic if they let's say, responded to my last email instead of sending the wrong I'm a reminder, just, you know, just pop up a notice to the salesperson, you know, yep. saying, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done. Uh, so, but you're right at its heart. That's all it is. And how do you guide people on taking what they maybe do today manually mm-hmm. and moving it over uh, to a workflow automation? Like it sounds really that as soon as we think about the way that we've been interacting with people manually, we can just figure out a way to mirror that inside of the software. Is right. that it? It is exactly. And I think there's, there's these great aha moments where people have been doing it manually for so long. They realize they just yeah. have to set it up once in the beginning yeah. and, and, you know, tweak it with time to make it better. But, you know, anybody, you know, sending out an outlook campaign or a, or a uh, MailChimp campaign, you yes. Know, four times, or or and it's it's not going to be consistent. It's because it, it's just you know you, people run out of time. You know, you send one one day, and you wait a week. You send another, and you're probably not reacting to what they did before. So maybe you're sending duplicates, and and, and four weeks long. Oh my god, I got to start that campaign again. 
It's just right. the automation just takes so much of the headache away. You set it up and then you, uh, like I said, you trigger it based on whatever the action is. Somebody registering for a, for, uh, 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 registering for a download or you, you, you know, you um, cold calling, you get the email for, for, for somebody and you want to put them in a, a prospect uh, campaign. But um, it, it, I, I see a lot of ahas <laughs> and a lot of yes. people once they, once they get that, uh, even that first market automation set up. And then being able to react to somebody who doesn't open an email or does open an email, like uh, that's fantastic. Right. Just think of even your savings in terms of the time you get back and how much quicker you could respond to people if you weren't mired in having to send all of those transactional things, those, yep. you know, thanks, I received your renewal notice or mm -hmm you know, just to let you know, we've got this coming up. If right. those were taken off your plate, you'd be able to, when a real person says, Hey, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> you, you could hop right on that. Right. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Uh, do you, do you imagine that companies want to build towards being able, let's imagine they are in the happy circumstance where they have so many people who've signed up for things and are looking for information that they want to start to, spread them out a little and, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like a teacher does with students to try and figure out which ones are maybe your, you know, grade A pupils and mm -hmm. which ones aren't, you know, the best prospects or yeah. they might be, but they're not quite ready. Like, how yeah. do you start to do yeah. that? And what what is the best way within marketing automation to uh, try and, you know, even hold off some before they get to sales? Because I, I think what happens in the early days is sales gets everyone yep. and that can turn sales off because a lot of those people aren't ready. Right. That's, you, you know, I mean, you're, you're, uh, this is a very good question you, you bring up and, um, typically you don't have to worry about what we're talking about here for, for a little bit until you've got, uh, a, a, you know, a few sales or you're <laughs> running out of cycles in your marketing and sales team. But, but yeah. the, 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 the the one thing I've seen success with, and it's pretty industry standard once you're marketing mature, is you start actually uh, grading your content. So you add a score to different pieces of content. So, and then, um, so let's say let's say you've got three pieces of content on your uh, on your website. You've got a video, uh, you've got a blog, and you've you know, uh, you've got a web page and you've got a couple other things. Each one of those pieces of content gets a score uh, based on uh, how in depth they are or how much work it takes to read them. And what yep. you do, as everybody interacts with your website or interacts with your emails, you, you, they get a score for everything they do. So, and, and once they reach a certain threshold score, that's when you, they get sent to sales to follow up. So let's take a very simple example. Let's say you've got a uh, you've got a contact where you've sent emails and they uh, so you've sent them five emails they've opened one and they've uh, looked at a web page so they might have a score of I'm just going to make it up they might have a score of 21 which okay. is one point for opening an email and 20 points for looking at a web page sure. they're not really I would say warm they're not really uh, ready to be followed up by sale because they really don't know much about your brand and they haven't really shown that much of an interest in your brand. Whereas, let's say you've got another prospect, and over the last two months, they've opened four emails, they've looked at a few web pages, they've um, uh, downloaded a video, and maybe they've liked something on your Twitter. So if you add up all the interactions and the points you've assigned them, they might have 100 points. And 100 points might be the threshold to say, when somebody hits 100 points, that's when it's time for sales to reach out to them. So sure. You, you basically put the people that are kind of mildly interactive or mildly interested in a holding pattern until they tip the scales and shown a bit more interest, right? Right. It's very right. scary for new companies to, to do that because like you said, they're following up with everybody. But at some point in time, you're going to get to be the size where you just don't have time to follow up with everybody, like you said. and you yeah. really Or you don't find it fruitful. Well, exactly, right? Exactly. So uh, it's, 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 called, it's called scoring. Um, and it, it want, and these market automations are very good at doing that for you. They help you assign a score to every type of interaction or every type of content, and they help you um, uh, calculate those scores. Oh, and by the way, you set up an auto automation to say when a, when a contact reaches, very simple automation, 
when a contact reaches a hundred, a score of a hundred or whatever your threshold is, it actually sets up a, a task in the CRM and emails the salesperson to follow up with them. Right. right. So more, you're, you're, uh, that's another case where you're taking the t- taking the manual effort out of something and letting automation do your work for you. Yeah. And you said they, you know, should at some point be integrated. Uh, and I think that's one of the benefits of it. The salesperson, they just begin, you know, by logging in as they do every day. And this time it's showing them something that they can action. Yeah. And I think that's great. Um, I see one other benefit and let's maybe zoom up for a second here to it's long after that particular prospect has, you know, followed through these systems and they've become a paying customer. Um, Do you imagine that when we've integrated our databases that we can, for example, give the company founders or C-level a report that says, all right, so we have, you know, this much in revenue that came in and it was with this many customers. Now we've gone back and sourced where we got those customers from. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it turns out that X percent of the time they were marketing fed leads. Right. Right. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. That's Uh, uh, so I guess we can even take it further. I mean, if the marketing automation system knows if our touch points with them began with, let's say, a paid campaign or like you suggested, an event or, you know, maybe they were referred by one of our partner sites. right? Right. Like that information also carries along too, right? It piggybacks its way all the way down to the end of the journey, right? And you can decide at that point, all right, are we getting revenue from the sources that we expected to and which ones are working best? Yep, exactly. And I mean, because we all know like paid paid campaigns and social, some of these things are expensive. So why spend money on things that aren't working, right? So especially for smaller companies that are doing Google paid search, it's it's such a a time intensive uh, and potentially money uh so a high dollar value uh, yes investment so if you if you can yes. you know let's determine if it's actually working yeah yeah that's yeah. good is yeah. there anything else in that kind of we've reached i think the end point that you described at the start anything else uh that it needs to have for it to really provide all these functions or do you think we've covered it all um Smaller, uh, I think. I think um, it's included in the marketing automation systems, but it, it's the analytics part, kind of following on what you right. talked on before. It's it, like all of these tools have sections for reporting and analytics, and I think it's very important to set up set it up so that your if you don't remember to log into it every week, make sure you're getting getting that the the system to email you a report every couple of days or every week about. Uh, the different performance indicators, you know, how many leads you're getting, how much activity those leads are doing, where your leads are coming from, uh, how much time people are spending on the website. Because it's it's good to get in the habit of knowing and, and craving that information early in the in the in the your business process, so that it's not foreign to you when it when it comes time to start making decisions uh, about what to do based on that that, that information, right? Uh, yeah. Or if I maybe put it on its head, if you do have people who aren't that close to this and maybe who are, you know, not automatically going to keep plowing money into marketing and sales quarter after quarter, mm-hmm. um, they need to have an answer of, all right, well, tell me what's working. Um, or if it isn't working, tell me how you think you might tweak it so yep. that it can work, right? And analytics is the solution there. Yep, exactly. And any of your listeners that are going for uh, looking for funding or to get more funding, that's one of the <laughs> one of the big things the investors want to know, the conversion yep. rates of your website, you know, what's working, what's not working, exactly what you said. So it's very you, you position yourself much uh, stronger if you if you're intimate with that information and you're not and you don't answer the question with a uh, 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 you know, like <laughs> <laughs> right. back to you. You know, you mean that doesn't work? Okay, <laughs> I'll take your word for it. Uh, so, Steve, I am curious. I mean, you you know a whole lot about this stuff, and so I'd really like to know if you could take me back and tell me, kind of, how did you come to be this person who can uh, be a consultant to companies who 
uh, have whatever amount of automation that they do or not and right. help them build out what's actually going to be providing them with a good, uh, solid, you know, tech stack. Right. How did you, how did you end up here? What, what were the pieces that led to this? Well, I think, um, you know, back in whatever year it was, I'm going to, by memory will serve as maybe 2010, 2011, when seemingly there was only six marketing technologies out there when there's like 40,000 now. I yeah. just remember being in a couple of meetings and, and talking about Salesforce and talking about uh, trying to integrate MailChimp. I remember getting butterflies at the whole, like butterflies in my tummy about excited about okay, let's, let's find a solution. How can we integrate these? Okay, so let's get the developers and let's get the marketers. Let's get everybody in a room to make sure we're, uh, you know, you're getting what you need and I'm getting what I need and we can actually get this done. And then, it, you know, and then it was talking about integrating another tool and then realizing, you know, going on the internet, you know, six months later and realize, oh my gosh, there's something that does that. Oh, okay, well, let's, let's see if we can, let's see if we can integrate that tool in. And so just that, so that butterfly and that thirst for um, the rapid change that was happening in the uh, in the marketing automation space and the and, and the whole tech stacks that it got me hooked, got me hooked, and then nice. I was lucky to work with some very big companies um, in my in in the past on these big systems. So uh, to to show the potential of what these uh, these tools could be, and the yes. fact that it was completely democratized. You know, you've got these startups uh, with enterprise functionality because you're paying 20 bucks a month for the same thing that the big guys are using, right? That's that's pretty exciting. It's hilarious that you're talking about the uh, like the year 2010. I do think that was, uh, in a way, a watershed. Um, if I remember back, and you know, you and I are roughly the same age. Um, when you look at the types of CRM that were available in the late. 90s and early 2000s names like PeopleSoft and yeah. Oracle and yeah. Siebel, right? These were the, these were the places that large companies went to for this tech, uh, and that was about the only places that they went to. And yeah. you know, then we had a, a couple of kind of early ones that, like on their own, I remember let's say Silver Pop and yeah. um at at the time, you know, Pardot was getting going, mm -hmm. um, HubSpot was getting going. And you're right, they were uh none of them were bought by uh large companies at that point, although many since have been. But they were they were trying to explain how like every company could do what these companies who'd had these massive systems before uh, we're doing and it, it, yeah I agree with you it kind of democratized it didn't it yeah it did very much and half, thank gosh <laughs> yes well and, and so let's talk about kind of the glue because I think there's you know we always talk about people process and technology so on the people side uh, is it fair to say that up until 2010 you mainly had to have a lot of IT strength in in shop inside your your yeah. company, yeah. Um, and that mattered whether you you know like I, I need to distinguish it. Even if you had let's say people who are building a SaaS product, um, you have to have people slaved to your marketing automation or CRM system back in the day yeah. uh, because it needed that amount of care and feeding, right? Absolutely, yep. Yeah. yeah, and so Steve you know, you don't have an IT background. I don't either. But so I think one thing that's really interesting here is there you are in 2010 and you're saying it can be done, dot, dot, dot. I can do it. Okay. Like it's not that heavily technical right. as the past systems were, you know, people like me can do this. Am I reading you right? Absolutely. These systems are now are, are built for marketers, not programmers. Right, so that's right. why you're you're seeing the shift in big companies. The the owner yes. of these platforms isn't tech technology generally anymore. It's usually marketing. Yeah, right? that's the shift that kind of started to happen in around 2015, 2016. So you're right. So I'll bring up I'll bring up the uh, the Spider Man line here because if they are built for marketers and marketers are now given great power, uh, it you know what comes with it, right? Great responsibility. Great responsibility. Yep. Uh, so like from that point on. Do you 
did you see yourself as having the responsibility to try and find a lot of companies that need this stuff and to try to say to them, look, you can do it with what you've got. You, you don't have to have, you know, a boatload of people or a boatload of money uh, yeah. to do this. Yep. Absolutely, Glenn. You're absolutely right. It's, it's, they say you eat an elephant one bite at a time, right? So you don't yeah. go into this, you don't go into this kind of stuff expecting to, to boil the ocean and do, you know, all these complicated automations. <laughs> just, like I said, simply start with, if you're, if you've got a free trial or you've got a demo, just start with that, conver- trying to convert the free to paid or the, yeah. the, 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 the prospect to paid, right? Right. Start there and, and just keep. Yeah. And, and it's a good, and and it's also an important distinction, uh, and I hope I don't uh, tick off any of uh, my good engineering or technology friends who are listening by saying this. But the difference between it being in the hands of a marketer versus an engineer, the engineer will gravitate to, oh, look at all the things I can do. Mm-hmm. The marketer will look at it and say, what does my boss expect me to do? Right. Right. What numbers am I being held to and how do I drive those targets? Yeah. Right. And so I think you having the marketing background, because I take it you've been doing marketing for years and years and years <laughs> and then saying, OK, well, this is a new tool, but it's a means to an end. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. How will how will it, it progress my user? How will it in, in, increase my user experience, the user's experience in their, yes. in their uh, um sales journey and their journey to becoming a customer, right? And when the user wins, yeah, the company wins. The company wins, absolutely. That's very good words. I think that kind of covers it, Steve. Is there anything else, any maybe last thing that you want to share that you would uh, encourage anyone who's, no matter where they are on this journey, just one thing that they should maybe try to keep in mind as they're moving along in their marketing automation? Um. Try to be uh, as thoughtful uh, and personable and approachable in your communications uh, and the content that you write uh, as much as you can, right? Like at the end of the Good day, advice. you need to create a connection with every with every user. So versus, you know, instead of doing a quick email or a spray and pray to a lot of people like they call it, just sit down and think like like uh what's in it for the user what's going to move right. the needle on the user don't don't necessarily focus on just getting a call back worry about disseminating some thoughtful information to the user and if you do that yes. it's it's going to work instead of reams and reams of content just uh concentrate on thoughtful personable uh timely content or yeah. timely content. and i mean if they're continuing to read these strip emails you've got more than one kick at the can yeah, so exactly. Right. If you if you want to if you want to say a lot, go ahead and say it, but break it over four or five emails. Yep. Yep. Excellent point, Glenn. Yep. That's exactly it. That's awesome. Uh, Steve, if anybody wants to get in touch with you and, you know, follow up with more that, you know, because I know you've only scratched the surface. What's the best way to get in touch with you? Um, Probably through my uh, well, you can email me uh, uh, at uh, shock and co. So S-H-O-C-K-A-N-D-C-O at gmail.com or you can reach out to me on my LinkedIn page. I'm the only Steve Shock in Ottawa. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll include those in the show notes. Uh, I can't thank you enough, Steve. It's uh, been very nice to kind of hear just a plain English, level-headed, you know, we have been talking about this technology the whole time, but at no time in the conversation has it, you know, gone into great engineering depth. And so thank you very much for kind of keeping us at that level, because that's where we're going to really pull off what we need to do to achieve this. Uh, and, you know, as you say, the tools have been made to be simple enough that we can get it done. So really, what's our excuse, but really just to get going and take ourselves to the next step. You're exactly right, Glenn. Thank you. It's my, been my pleasure to attend. Thanks very much. And awesome. thanks for taking the time to listen. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to the listener. If you uh, have liked what you've heard today, I'm encouraging you, if you don't already, please subscribe on wherever you listen to audio. And if you could think of somebody who would benefit from hearing what Steve and I have been talking about and share it with them, just go ahead and, you know, hit the share on your phone. Or if you want to grab the URL from our site, pop it over to them. We thrive on having more listeners who can find out about this stuff, and we really appreciate it. And if you have any feedback, please go ahead and reach out to us. 
We can be on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn as well. And just look me up at, at Hey Glen S or at Funnel Reboot. We'll talk again soon. Thanks for listening. Follow the show on Twitter at Funnel Reboot. If you like what you have heard today, please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts.